Hi everyone, welcome back to another episode of Business on the Beach. And I have a very special guest today. We have Steve Sims joining me today. Steve, thanks for coming on. Thanks very much for having me. Steve is the founder of Bluefish, which is a luxury concierge service. And he's also an author and a professional speaker as well. And uh, we were chatting just before we we started, Steve, about your Wikipedia page because you apparently didn't know you had one. I didn't know. You never know what's out there. The problem is there's so many different, so many different uh, browsers, web services, platforms. Um, no, I, I didn't know I had one, so I'm definitely going to check it out. <laughs> All right, so I thought we'd uh, sort of run through and you could tell us how much of it is true. Okay. According to your, your page, Steve, uh, you began as a bricklayer in London. Is, is that accurate? That's accurate. Hey, you got one off the list. Awesome. So what, what got you involved with that then? Where, where, did, where did that sort of come into it? Is that just something your family did and you sort of took up the family business kind of thing? Or did you learn yeah. it? What was the process? I don't think anyone kind of wakes up one day and says, hey, I want to be a bricklayer. Um, <laughs> I, was, uh, I was, you know, just born into it. My, my mum used to run the business side. My dad used to run the construction bit. So it was a simple situation as I grew up. It was just destined that I would leave school and end up, end up in there. So I left school at the age of 15. Um, and they let me sleep in for one day and get bored. The following day, kicks me out of bed at 5.30 and took me on the building site. So that was my introduction to being a builder. Wow, cool. So was that, did, did you enjoy that then? Or was it kind of like you were forced into it a little bit? You didn't know what you didn't know. So it was one of those times that you just thought, is this it? Is this my life? And you just went about doing what you were told to do. And being a, you know, I would, I remember one stage thinking I was incredibly poor. Um, I later on edited that to realize that we were actually financially not wealthy, yet I was very affluent in love, care, morals, work ethics. But at the early stages, we didn't know how to spell Gucci or Prada. You know, we never knew what any of these things were like. And bearing in mind, this was also the 80s. So we never had Instagram to have, you know, people shoving cars they don't own down our throat. So, you know, we never had that. We didn't know what it was like. You go on Instagram now and you can see the world or see the, see the pictures of the made up world we didn't know, you know, the nearest we got to that was maybe seeing a movie once a month. Um, but other than that, we just thought this is what you did. You got up, you went to work, you came home, you went to the pub on Friday night and you had the weekend to do nothing. And then on Monday you went to work again. We, that was just what life was. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's one of those things, isn't it? It's a different way of life, isn't it? It's a different lifestyle that, that people tended to live. I've got into this as well, is you also were a stockbroker. Uh, is, <laughs> is that a real thing? Yeah. Uh, yes, but I think we'll probably end up doing this podcast longer than I was actually a stockbroker. I actually, <laughs> I talked my way in to get a job as a stockbroker. Um, in Hong Kong when I was working in London and a friend of mine was working in a bank and they were taking some interns over to Asia. And I talked my way into going over there with this huge, great group of people that they were sending. I landed on the Saturday. I did orientation on the Monday and I was fired on the Tuesday. So I was a stockbroker for 24 hours of my life. Wow. It, it, for, funnily enough, it actually says... On, the, on here, right? so this is, you know, quoting Wikipedia here, you probably want to edit this bit out. Uh, apparently, you, you worked in London first for about, a, according to this, six months, and then you transferred to Hong Kong, and you lasted five days, according to this. <laughs> <laughs> no, I worked, I was uh, an insurance salesman in um, London. Um, uh, I'll have to find out how to better get on that thing, but I was an insurance <laughs> salesman. Um, in London uh, when I was trying to get out of the brick lane industry. And that's yeah. when I found out about um, the stockbroking world. Um, but no, I wasn't, uh, I didn't last five days. I wish I had, um, <laughs> yeah. but uh, no, I, I didn't, I didn't last long. Right. It says you also moved on to, to starting or you 
you know, you became a doorman as well at a, a nightclub. Is, is that accurate? Yeah, I was, I was a doorman. You know, in London, I was a doorman. Um, when I lost my job in Hong Kong, I then jumped back on the door work. And I, I, I believe the best communicators in the planet are not politicians, they're bar staff. Now, the trouble with uh, doormen, doormen are there to basically kind of like, you know, look scary, you know, handle any issues and trouble and can like put up with your crap when you've had a few too many beers. But it's a great viewpoint to actually see the world by. And I always used to admire the bar staff. A good bartender can communicate with 10 different clients in 20 different ways. And I used to watch that with fascination. That's what got me really interested into the world of communication. What sort of lessons did you learn from the observations then? Because, you know, as, as someone that has worked, you know, with, with the public as well, or at least communicating to the public, is you do learn quite a lot about people. And the amount of times that sometimes you might feel like you're making an assumption or you're jumping the gun or you're trying to jump too far ahead because you, you connect dots inside your head that most people don't. The more you communicate with people, you know, you, you find patterns, don't you? So what sort of things did, did you realize? Well, I noticed, first of all, that, you know, you'd have a bartender, male or female, and at the bar would be a couple of suits that had just come in from, from work for a drink, a bunch of girls that were going for a girls' night out, a bunch of lads that thought they were going to have a rave up that night and score. There'd, all these, there'd be all these social dy- dynamics at the bar, and a good bartender could turn around and say, uh, hello, gentlemen, you know, you ready for a good time? You know, how may I help you? What would you like? Yet to the girls, you'd be like, ladies, we're ready to have a few shots. They would be able to pick up on social cues and body language and be able to react to the way they communicated. I found it a talent because the trouble is, if you've got 10 different countries or 10 different languages, should I say, talking to you in English, even though they're talking to you in English, they're actually listening to what you're saying in different cultures, in different forms, based on different experiences. Just because the language is English, what they mean, say, or what you understand and say can be read in different manners. It's a, it's a fine art form in truly understanding how to communicate, how to be impossible to misunderstand and how to actually translate appropriately with different people. And when I say translate, I don't just mean you're talking to someone who's from Germany that speaks English. I'm on about when you talk to uh, millennials, when you talk to an older generation, when you talk to a business dynamic, when you speak in an entertainment environment, how you say what you say and how you communicate it needs to be uh, translated differently for different uh, locations and dynamics. Did you find then that when you, when you try and communicate with people, you try to match their own style, does that have a benefit? Yeah, it does. And they call that mirroring. Um, yeah, there's, you first of all got to want, like if someone says to you, um, I know, say, uh, I, it, it's right on, you know, uh, right on. I'm looking for something larger than life. Yeah. Don't turn around to the person and go, hey, I'm going to give you something that's amazing and brilliant. Say, I've got this. You wanted something that's larger than life. I have that. Use that terminology. Right. You know, I'm looking for a wild night out. Well, if you're looking for wild, then we've got to go here. You know, use that terminology to show that you know how to relate to them, communicate, and you actually understand what I'm saying. That's a, that's a real imperative point within any communication. Use the language that they're using with you. Right, I get that. Yeah, so you sort of you use their words because that's the words they understand. Yeah, exactly. That's the, that's the language that they're talking in. So yes, cool. So we're gonna go back to um, Wikipedia in a minute. But, <laughs> <laughs> so you, you, people say, "Oh, you never know what's in Wikipedia." But right now, right, right now, this is going amazingly well. Um, one, one last question, I suppose, before we do sort of fly through it is. Do you ever feel like you need to discover your own unique style a little bit? So the more you speak to other people and the more you kind of blend your own terminology to match theirs and all those things, there's, someone might turn around and say, well, how do you then 
figure out your own, like when you go out in public and all those things, because you, you have your own style, like your own words and your own terminology and all those things. But then because you spend so long communicating to others and matching their style, it can be quite hard to like redefine what your own style is. What's your take on that? No, the first thing you've got to do is you've got to show that you can relate. And then you've got to show if you're in a position where they've come to you for advice, you've got to show that you can direct and lead. So when you're talking to someone, the first thing, the first thing in any communication, and I don't care if you're dealing with Elton John, the Pope, or whether or not you're talking to someone in your local school or someone you're trying to do business with or a client, first of all, you've got to relate to them. Hey, I understand what you're saying. Hey, you wanted something large, you wanted something wild. Yeah, that's fine. Why is that? What you do is you show you relate by establishing communication based on the words that they've spoken, the words they've used. And then what you do is you challenge. You know, hey, I'm looking to do this. Hey, I understand you're looking to do this, but can I understand, or in order for me to understand, let me ask you a question. Why is that important to you? Start challenging what it is they're saying so you can get down to the core of what it is that they want to do. Then. And here's the key, then you direct them to where they need to go. This is brilliant. Have you possibly thought of doing X? Have you considered doing Y? Have you ever tried A, B, C? You know, because the bottom line of it is they say that the client is always right. Bollocks and bullshit. <laughs> the client doesn't know what they don't know. That's your job. Yeah. If the client knew everything, they wouldn't need you. So the first tact the first hack is to show you can understand them relate and talk to them in their in their language challenge them and then lead them to where they need to be not where they say they want to be not where they have told you they want to go but where based on your experience knowledge and expertise they have to go people have said to me in the past have i ever failed at doing anything and the the answer uh, sorry, not failed to ever do anything. Have I ever failed to give the client what they wanted? The key to there is what they wanted. Clients ask you something, and I've never given it to them. I've never given a client what they asked for. I've given them what they wanted by asking them why it was important that they got this. What needs to happen for them to be satisfied? What needs to occur for them to believe they got great value out of this? Those are all challenging questions which means I never failed because I never gave them what they first asked for. We've now determined a new goal and that's what I go after. So it's almost like um, you sort of, you figure out what they think that they need, but then sometimes you can achieve it in a different way. There's, there's sometimes what they think will get them what they want might not actually get them what they want. And that's where you then step in and say, look, that might not actually work, but this thing will, and therefore we're going to do that instead. But when was the last time you walked into a doctor's and you went, hey, I've got a pain in my leg, I need you to operate here, I need you to dissect this, and I need to be injected with this medicine? You don't. You walk into the doctor and you give them your symptoms, and the doctor says we're going to do this, 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 and you just follow. Why? Because you trust your doctor, you trust that he's in a position where he's more knowledgeable than you. You need to establish straight off that this is what you do. Whatever your business is, plumber, painter, concierge, coach, you need to establish that you do what you do and that's why you're in business. The client doesn't know what they don't know. That's your job to be able to look after them and give them what they need and not what they've asked for. Yeah, it's almost like that's that's what makes the difference, right? Like they wouldn't, as you said, they wouldn't come to you in the first place if they already knew what to get, what they wanted, or you know, sometimes they probably tried things in the past and it's not worked, and that's why they came to you in the beginning. And if you can't show that you can deliver that, then you know, they probably go somewhere else, right? How did? They don't, uh, yeah, they don't need you. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Like, why, why would they come to you if you can't get them what they need? I suppose. Yep. So did you go straight from this to Bluefish then after this experience and finding out you know, about how people work and how people communicate and all those things? Or was there like a process in between? Well, there was a process. Um, coming from a bricklayer and now being on the door, I didn't feel as though I'd actually affected much of my, uh, 
potential for monetary gain. You know, there was no way in the world I was going to become a millionaire working on the bloody door. Um, so I focused on how to communicate with affluent people with the idea that if I got on and had some friends who were affluent, sooner or later, they would offer me a job. And I thought, you know, if I know five millionaires, sooner or later, I'll become a millionaire by default. You have the simple case of you are the combination of the five people you hang around with. So my goal was very simple. Hang around, communicate, be friend, be of value to millionaires and billionaires. So I started throwing parties. I started getting people into events. I started throwing events. I started getting people stuff that they wanted. I became a concierge to the, to the rich um, with the idea that sooner or later they would take me on. I never expected to launch a concierge out of it. It was only ever focused to actually get um, into communication with affluent people. Before I realized it, I'd actually launched a career. I'd launched an industry. My company, uh, very, very arrogantly, is one of the leaders and helped define what is now the luxury concierge market. Um, and it did very well. Well, it's still doing very well 20 plus years later. Um, but that's, that was my focus, get in front of people. I never expected Bluefish to be born. I never expected it to be anything. What sort of techniques or tactics, because you mentioned parties and things, which seem to, to work, I guess. I mean, events do attract a certain type of person. But what sort of techniques and strategies did you use to not just feel like you can bring them some value somewhat, but even just to get in front of them? Because some of the people that I've done some research and finding out who you've actually helped and worked with, a lot of these people have, should we say, um, they're in their own bubble or they've got a barrier or there's like a door that you need to know the key for to get through just in order to be able to communicate with these people. Never mind go to the next level and feel like you can help them or give them something that's valuable to them. So how did you actually start that process just to get on their radar before you then took things up a level? Well, you've got to do some research. If you want to get in touch with someone, then bring value to the table in seconds. So if you want to have a conversation, I did a, and I'm not plugging my book, but I did this, um, I mentioned this in a chapter in my book where I actually planned to get in front of someone because I wanted to work with them. So I found out, you know, where they went, where they partied, where they drank. And I found out there was a gala coming up that they were going out to. So I actually went to this gala and I actually made sure that when this guy went to the bar, I went up and started a conversation with him based on some articles that I'd actually read on him and some of the passions and hobbies he had. Now, I put this in my book about how I basically targeted this guy and went, uh, went and got him. He actually phoned me up when the book came out and was very angry. And he said to me, there's a, there's a chapter in this book about how you targeted someone to get to talk to him. Was that me? <laughs> and I said to him, I said, um, yeah, it was. I said, I felt that I could bring so much value to a relationship that I wasn't willing to let it go to chance. So I did my research on what you liked, what you liked to talk about, where you hung out, what your interests were, and then I planned to meet you. I said, do we have a good relationship? And he said, yes. And I said, well, there you go then. I wasn't willing to leave it to chance. Are you okay with that? And he was actually flattered. And I've heard from people that have been in the room with him where he's actually promoted now about, oh, have you read this book, Blue Fishing by Steve Sims? That's me in the book. And he actually tells people how he was one of the guys targeted. So if there's someone you're trying to get a hold of, and again, don't blow it out of all proportion. It doesn't matter if it's Elon Musk or it's a businessman in your own little village. Whoever it is, do some research. What do they like to talk about? What are their interests? And make sure you, and in air quotes, bump into them and go, hey, how you doing? Oh, I read something that you were interested in horses. Oh, I read something that you did so-and-so. Hey, nice. I love your watch. I like the watch as well. Strike up a conversation on what they like because nothing will get people talking faster and longer than when it's talking about something they love. Does it matter where you go for the research? Because obviously I am conscious of the fact that I'm currently conducting this via 
you know, Wikipedia to a certain extent, Steve. Are there certain places that are, should we say, more valid or more, I guess, official than others? Because you can't, you know, you can't believe everything that you read. I mean, I'm extraordinarily lucky that we were talking before this and we agreed that I was going to go off Wikipedia for the start. Uh, otherwise, I would have gone somewhere else. So does it matter the sources that you go from? Because with these people, you, at least my impression is you can't really get this sort of thing wrong. The uh, Wikipedia I've never <laughs> used. So, um, you know, I, I've used it for my own kind of like history research, you know, when, when I've been looking up something. But, you know, like I can say, we didn't put that page together. I don't know who's put the page together. Um, you're the first one that actually told me I had a Wikipedia page. Uh, what I do is I focus on images. So let's say, for argument's sake, you're trying to get hold of someone in your village. Um, and again, it doesn't matter where your village is. Google them, go to images, okay? Or go to the social feeds and look at the pictures. If 20 out of 30 pictures have them pictured with a horse, you can assume they're equestrian lovers. If 20 out of 30 pictures show them on a surfboard, you can assume they're a surfer. So, Start focusing on the images. I love the images. Um, and then I backtrack from there. Maybe there's an article on that person that does surfing and maybe they love this famous surfboard brand. And when you meet them next, you can go, hey, a little birdie told me you love such and such surfboards. So do I, you know, do some research on, on the surfboard. Find out a way to connect with them and again, relate to them by doing a little bit of invested in gift stuff first. I had trouble saying that. <laughs> <laughs> I like that though, like, like how you you use the images because you know if someone you know as you say like if if Elon Musk has fifty pictures next to his Tesla, then you assume that he likes his cars, you know, and um, I, I feel like that's that's probably a good way of doing it because you can't believe everything that you read half the time, and you know I've had I've had moments when I have questioned stuff in the past and I've done my own bits of digging and I go well surely there must be a better way so yeah I like the uh, the images that's a pretty uh, good piece of advice actually Steve yeah how did you get your your first client for Bluefish then was it done this way did you was it the guy that you spoke to you know you, you bumped into him at the at the gala or was there something else that made people go from like a friend to feeling like they can work with you so there was a few things. Nowadays, I don't waste my time. Nowadays, I'm very pinpoint laser focused. Um, in the old days, funny enough, I focused on what I did to generate the right kind of people. And then, and you can do this now with social, if I needed to get hold of someone, I would ask around, hey, who knows Billy? Until I found someone, because someone told me years ago, and I really like this saying, no one ever walked onto a roof. They got there by climbing a ladder. So the bottom line of it is, if I come up to you and I go, hey, how you doing? My name's Steve Sims, and I've done stuff with Elon Musk, the Pope, Richard Branson. I've got a Wikipedia page. I've sent people <laughs> down to the Titanic. I've written a brilliant book. Like, if I tell you all of that, you're going to switch off within seconds. Mm. You know, you're going to look at it like I'm you know, full of myself. I'm arrogant. I'm self-promoting. I'm marketing. I'm precocious, blah, blah, blah. But let's say for I'm sake, you're sat in a pub with your mate and I walk through the door. I haven't seen you and I turn around, your mate turns around to you and he says, uh, hey, you see that guy over there? That's Steve Sims. He's worked with the Pope, Elon Musk. He's sent people down to the Titanic. He's got a Wikipedia page. He's a, a, a brilliant author of Blue Fish and the Art Making Things Happen. If your best mate says all of those things, it's now gospel. Mm -hmm. Why? Because you're hearing it from a credible source. So in the, in the old days, the old days, listen to me. In the <laughs> old days, pre-Facebook pre and MySpace and all that, I would ask the people that I had in my, in my contact list, who knows Billy? Nowadays, I go out to my list, and I can search in my list who's in certain industries and fields. 
and I can ask them, do you know Billy? And then I can get them to make the introduction. So again, by the time I get in front of Billy, he's heard my name from two people that are credible, and now he's open to listening. So does it, does it matter then that you sort of, because one of the platforms that jumped out to me when you mentioned that is LinkedIn, because it tells you like your third connection, your second connection, which is basically someone that knows someone that knows someone that you might want to then connect with. So it's sort of avenue you go down. So finding someone that knows someone that you want to connect with is better than you trying to go in like cold essentially and try to, I don't want to say win them over, but try to connect with them without having any prior information, I guess, traded beforehand. And then you mentioned the source as well is that it's, we all know that referrals are, are helpful. Referrals are how you, you sort of build things and build that relationship a lot faster. You know, that, that's why celebrity endorsements are really popular with brands because you sort of siphon off the trust of, of the celebrity or the athlete, yeah? So how, how important is that when you try and build relationships with, with higher profile people then? Because I feel like they might keep their, their network quite closely knit together. So is, is finding people that know them, like how you, you try to get involved with them as such? Yeah, it's, it's, you've got, you've got so many different ways of doing it now, but I've always found the best way to connect with anyone is to get someone to introduce you. All right, cool. Is it, is it hard in the beginning then? Because when you started out, you know, you, you didn't think you were able to do what you do now. How, how did you find that first one? How, how did you get involved? Because I feel a lot of them know each other. Like, well, one of my main sports is tennis. And although they are quite competitive on the tennis court, you'd be surprised at how many of them know each other. Like, they all play at the same club. You are 100%. You know, they say, they say birds flock together. If, if, you know, if you know 10 rich people, I guarantee you, you're going to find another 20. Because... Tennis players, no tennis players. Racing drivers, no racing drivers. Singers, no singers. It's it absolutely, you're absolutely correct. So if you want to, when I started mine, bear in mind, my first thing was a turkey shoot. I just wanted rich people in my parties. So yeah. I, I made parties that were look, that looked so good that people would want to join. Um, and from there, I got to find out, <coughs> excuse me, I do apologize, sneeze them. Um, I made sure that I gave them a great party and then I reverse engineered it. Who came to my party? Oh, I had this person. Oh, I had a... So in the early stages, I never had any pinpoint focus. I went out on a turkey shoot just to get rich people. As soon as I knew the industries I wanted to attack, then you focus your marketing on that. And then if there's a person in that industry, maybe I've got to go to Billy, who knows Johnny, who knows Michael, who knows Sarah, who knows Rupert, who finally gets me there. I remember when I used to try and get hold of people, I may have to go through 10 people to get, get to someone. Now, I've been doing this for 20 plus years, I've only got to send one text or one voicemail, mm. and I can be introduced to pretty much anyone in the world. So was, was parties and events and things the way that you attracted those people? Like what, yeah. what, what, yeah. what would have I separated that from like just any old event? Like the most, I'd imagine there's something that made your events stand out as such as to attract those people versus, you know, just, just me putting on a function somewhere and hoping for the best. Well, I was actually, I was in Hong Kong at the time and all the Hong Kong bars you know, to be blunt, had strippers in them, okay? And I was one of the first guys that actually said, I, want, I, I don't mind the dancers being in there, but they're not allowed to strip. So, because people don't want what they can see, they want what they can dream and desire. There's that titillation. Um, so I started telling the girls that they could come in, but they were not allowed to get undressed. The strange thing is, people liked that more. It was different. So the girls would pay more attention in what they wore rather than just getting naked. 
um, the ladies started coming along and enjoying it more. And I gave people what they wanted. They wanted seduction. They wanted desire. They wanted cool surroundings. So I would focus not on just a club with a bunch of strippers. I'd focus on a yacht with good DJs and good music and interesting cocktails. I focused on the attention to detail. And that's what made me stand out. Back in the 80s, they thought if they got loud music, a load of drink and a bunch of strippers, the club would be packed. And to be blunt, most of the time it was. But sure. for us, we started focusing on what people desired rather than what they could see. Is it a way that you could find that out previously? Is it a case of just figuring out what the, the trends are and all those things and you sort of follow what what's current or is there a specific way of finding out what these types of people want before you go into it and put these, these events together? So at the time, what I was doing was I looked at it and I was, you know, I've been with my wife forever. Um, and there were a lot of guys that wanted to go out and party, but they weren't able to find the right kind of place. They either were in a seedy little nightclub or they were in the bar of a hotel. And if they're in the bar of a hotel, let's be blunt, it costs lots of money to get drunk because bars and hotels are very expensive. Yeah. So I kind of found something in the middle. I realized that there was a, uh, something missing and I got in the middle and actually found a way of actually bringing it to people. So look at the problem that you can solve. And if there's a demand for it, then you're in business. Like at the moment, if I was to sell, um, I don't know, snacks, the uh, withstood pressure of, um, you know, two miles under the water. That's great. You've just stopped something from combusting or serving snacks that wouldn't freeze in outer space. Well, you've solved the problem, but where's your market? No one's eating snacks in bloody space and no one's eating <laughs> snacks under the water. So only solve a problem where there's a marketplace demand. Now, I saw in the 80s in Hong Kong, you only had two options, bars in hotels or seedy nightclubs. The bars looked fantastic and everyone was dressed nicely, not like the bars I was working at, but there was no middle ground. I created a middle ground. So I looked like, where yeah. the problem was that I could solve. Yeah, like you found what was missing and you, you kind of filled it, so to speak. Correct. So is that, is that all that you did? So you found something that not many places had, but then did you find, did you find these, these people with your first event or did it take a few? This is me sort of going in with the idea of, okay, well, is that all well, the, that Steve took or was it a bit more to it? The good thing is because I was on the door, I was already seeing the clientele coming in. So if you're working you know, behind the till of, a, of an ice cream store, you can see what people are liking. You can see what people are moaning about. You're getting all of this market research at the counter. I was getting the market research at the door. Right. Does that make sense? So in which case, yeah, yeah. you know, I had all that. So when I started to throw the event, um, I had the ability to turn around and go, oh, I know, I, I heard you say something the other day. There's an event coming up in a couple of weeks' time. Would you like me to let you know about it when it, when it comes around? Now, if you didn't get enough people, you didn't tell anyone. But if you've got enough people going, oh, yeah, I'd really like to go to that, there's your client bank. Is there an element of, like, if you don't get enough people, you don't tell them? Do you, do you meet these people again? And say, oh, sorry, we didn't get enough people to the event, so we had to cancel it. Like, do you have, do you have to have that conversation afterwards? No. You just say, uh, you can say to someone, hey, I hear there's an event going on about it. As soon as I hear more information, would you let me know about it? You can even turn around and say, ah, oh, no, I, I, I don't know what happened to it. I don't know if it went on. You can just, you know, forget it. You haven't got to go, oh, I didn't have enough people, okay? But then when you do have enough people, go, oh, the event I found is on, and it's on this day. But at the time, I would market a couple of events, didn't get enough people. Then I'd say, oh, I don't know what happened to the event. But if I hear of a good one, I'll let you know. And I would just stay in communication with them. 
Right, got you. Yeah, so it's almost like you're, you're constantly promoting it, but then obviously because you didn't divulge a lot of information at that point, like you could have sort of maintained the relationship until you did get enough people and then there's your event. Yeah, exactly. All right, cool. So how did you transition then from doing the events and doing those kind of things to doing some of the more, I guess, the more experiential events that um, I've seen I've seen at the moment. So I've, you mentioned the Titanic. You've you've organised like tours and things. You you know you've worked with a lot of people. I mean, according to <laughs> according to Wikipedia, this is going to be yeah. amazing. I mean, if, if this is all accurate, right? This is this is amazing. We're in a podcast for the first time ever using a Wikipedia page. Or because we said at the beginning, should we see how should we see how accurate this is? <laughs> <laughs> so according to this, you work with. Donald Trump, Sting, Andrea Boicelli, I hope that's how you pronounce it right, and Elon Musk. Is there any others that you would, well, should we start with saying, oh, is that real? And have you worked with any other people as well? Uh, I never announced who we actually, um, I never announced who we work for. Right, okay. I, I never... The only reason that the names that have been mentioned or the events have been mentioned have been because either I've been spotted with the client and the clients confirmed it or the clients mentioned it. But me personally, I've never mentioned a client's name that hasn't already stated it first. Um, we've been doing this for 20 plus years. A lot of people like to say that we work with the rich and famous. We don't. The rich and famous only accounts for maybe 10% of my my contact list and my client base. I work with the richer and unknown. My clients own things like banks, countries. Um, they're billionaires and zillionaires from around the planet. I don't mention their names. They don't mention my name. And to be honest with you, you wouldn't even know who they were if I did mention them. But they're powerful enough that I never risk mentioning a thing. No, no, that's true. Yeah, it, it does make perfect sense. So we've got, according to Wikipedia then, so th these, these are people that either someone that has the power to get onto Wikipedia has apparently allegedly said that you work with Donald Trump, Sting, Andrea, Andrea Bocelli, I've got to make sure you get that last name right, and Bocelli, Elon yeah. Musk. Yeah, so are, they, are those people the people that you those have are actually worked with? Those are confirmed. Th those I can confirm. Okay, all right, cool. No, it's just good because you, you, you probably go into Wikipedia and go, this is all well and good, but uh, it might be worth deleting some of this. <laughs> <laughs> well, so far we seem to be doing all right. There's only a few few discrepancies, but um, the names are good. But Trump was ages ago. Um, that was in Palm Beach. So that um, was, uh, I had no idea at the time that I was going to be working with the uh, few, future president of America. <laughs> Yeah, the future most powerful man in the world, which is uh, must be a strange thought now looking back on it. Very um, strange thought. Very strange thought. <laughs> so, what what things have you have you learned working with these people? Then, I mean, it's it. I imagine it being different from working with the average person. By average person, I mean that's probably still some of your your actual clients as well. So, is it is it different? Are there, are there any similarities? Are there crossovers? Or are they just regular people like the rest of us? I don't have any normal clients. I don't have any <laughs> average people. Okay. okay? Um, I have people that literally own um, islands and uh, uh, countries. And I have clients that own print press manufacturers in South England. Um, so I have a wide dynamic of financial positioning, but every single one of my clients is exactly the same. They are self-made. They want uh, attention to detail. They are experiential over uh, pink slip, which means they prefer to experience something rather than to own it if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and so all of my clients in one way or another are entrepreneurs. Now, the other similarity is that they all have the same problems. Just because you have $100 million in the bank account 
does not mean you stop worrying about money. Because usually when you've got that kind of money, you're focusing on different, bigger uh, projects. But if that project goes wrong, you can still lose everything. You know, there's been times where Elon Musk has actually had to borrow money to exist, even though he was worth $100 million. There's a story of how he borrowed money after selling PayPal to invest in the startup of Tesla and uh, SpaceX. Um, and there's rumors every single bloody week that he's on the verge of bankruptcy. <laughs> People focus on growth. And with any growth, you get growing pains. So it doesn't matter what the financial pedigree of my clients are. They're all there to try new things. They all have the same problem. They all go to the toilet. They all have breakfast. There's no difference in that. But an entrepreneur is an entrepreneur. And every entrepreneur's journey is the exact same. You get sued, you get ripped off, you get lied to, you get ridiculed, you get laughed at. All of those things happen no matter what kind of entrepreneur you are. So is there an element there? Because what, I mean, it's a very, very, very enlightening thought, at least, that it doesn't matter how much money you have, you're always going to worry about money. Because as you say, you know, your, your ambitions match your ability to fulfill them. Yeah, you know what? What, what one person is a risky endeavor to someone else, they might need something bigger to get the same high as somebody else. And if they're, I guess, used to taking risks, used to being, you know, mildly successful or very successful, if they're the type of person that always wants to grow and always wants to expand, the business has to, I imagine, has to do that as well. So they're challenging, they're doing the bigger things, they're risking a lot of different things as well. And it does become like that, whereby nearly every time you've, you've got to figure it out. You've got to, you know, take the risk, as you mentioned, you know, it, even people that do have the millions, they do feel like that, that risk is part of it. And you never know what can happen, can you, to a certain extent? No, you're absolutely right. And, and that's, again, that's the, same, that's the same journey of an entrepreneur. Every entrepreneur is going to have problems, yet for some reason we're addicted. I heard someone say a couple of weeks ago, which did make me laugh, that entrepreneurs, they leave a, a, a job where they work for someone for 48, uh, for 40 hours a, a, a week to work in uh, insecurity for 80 hours a week. Um, entrepreneurs are kind of crazy misfits that try doing things that way and hope through passion and strength that it will work. But you never really know. Entrepreneurs are a strange, strange beasts. Yeah, yeah, definitely. All right, well, we've got last couple of questions for you then, Steve, just before we gotcha. finish. Go for it. Um, aside from your book, which we'll get to in a minute, do you have <laughs> any other recommendations for people that maybe want to learn a bit about communication? Maybe they want to dive into the topic after our conversation today? Um, Chris Voss, did, uh, he was a negotiator for the um, FBI, and he does a really good book. He's on Black Swan, uh, Chris Voss, V-O-S-S. -S. He's a sharp ki uh, kitty. Um, God, there's a whole bunch of communication books, and it really depends on where you are in your point of life as to which one you go for. Um, but I would say the good thing about nowadays, rather than going in for books, uh, go for podcasts and find someone that resonates with your tone of voice. You know, what you say, the speed in which they say it. You don't need to read a book now to get the information. You can, you can listen to a couple of podcasts and become just as uh, intelligent. Yeah, that's, that's an excellent point. I know I'm slowly transitioning away from books just because you can multitask when it comes to podcasts and audio books and it's nice to be able to do more than one thing at a time. I hear you either have a podcast or a podcast that might be coming out soon. Yeah, no, it's out. Um, I've, I've interviewed presidential candidates, prostitutes, captains of industry, restaurant owners, all famous people. Um, and it's all about, you know, communication. Um, it's doing really, really well. I actually, the last one that we just went out, and I don't know when this is going to go out, but the last one we did a couple of weeks ago that was released was um, this beautiful woman who's the head of the Las Vegas police force. And she oh, talks nice. about how she manages to 
look after a, a male uh, a male industry, a male community, while being a very attractive woman. It's um it's very powerful. And and let's be honest, uh, Alice Little talking about um prostitution and the power of intimacy and building up relationships. That was a hell of an episode as well. So yeah, we've been very fortunate with uh, the art of making things happen. Podcast has been doing really well. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. I'll put a, a link to the podcast in the description for the show. Um, last question for you then yep. is what would you like the world to know about you that it doesn't already know? God. Um, I think it pretty much, I'm an open book. It knows I can't spell. It knows I'm not the most intelligent person in the world. It knows that I have a bigger eye can than an IQ. Um, uh, God, what, what does it need to know that it doesn't already know? I don't know. Uh, probably that I'm actually pretty dull. Um, Instagram and my business can make me look really interesting, but when I'm not out doing stuff for clients, I like to sit at home with the dogs and the wife. So I would imagine something that may surprise people is actually just how remarkably dull I actually am. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's one way of putting it, Steve. Uh <laughs> <laughs> what's the, the name of your book as well? You mentioned it, uh, but just sort of spell it out for people so they can know where to get it. Sure. It's called Blue Fishing, The Art of Making Things Happen by Steve Sims. And there's only one M in Sims. Awesome, Steve. Well, thanks for being on the show, mate. I appreciate you carving out the time for us. And I'm sure we'll keep in touch. Cheers, buddy. Speak with you soon.